As our institutions of power move ever more toward critical race theory, Americans are fighting back and winning. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. This show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. It's time to stand up to big tech. Protect your data at expressvpn.com. Slash Ben, we'll get to all the news in just one moment. First, let's be clear about this. You are spending too much money on your cell phone bill. How do I know this? Because if you're not with Pure Talk USA, you are definitely spending too much money on your cell phone bill, which is why another thousand of you, my extraordinarily wise listeners, have made the switch from your overpriced wireless carrier to Pure Talk over the past couple of months. So here's the question. What are the rest of you waiting for? If you're with AT&T or Verizon or T-Mobile, your family could save over $800 a year just by switching over to Pure Talk. You get the same great coverage because they use the exact same towers as one of the big carriers. You can even keep your phone and your number, but you will be saving a fortune. By the way, Pure Talk is the top rated wireless company by Consumer Affairs with the absolute best customer service team based right here in America. If this sounds good, it gets even better. Right now, get unlimited talk, text, six gigs of data for just 30 bucks a month. And if you go over on the data, they're not going to charge you for it. Grab your mobile phone, dial pound 250, say Ben Shapiro. When you do, you'll save 50% off your very first month. Dial pound 250, say keyword Ben Shapiro to get started. Pure Talk is simply smarter wireless. A lot of the other big cell phone providers, they will tell you what you're getting. And then they really won't tell you. They're sort of obscure it because they're actually paying for their marketing campaigns and paying for their stores, the, the actual brick and mortar stores. Not so with Pure Talk USA. You know exactly what you're getting and what you're getting is what you need for less money. Pure Talk, simply smarter wireless. Dial pound 250, say Ben Shapiro to get started today. All righty. So you may have noticed that critical race theory has become the topic of the day. And the media are fighting mad about it. They are very, very angry about this. As we'll discuss, critical race theory has been infiltrating our institutions for literally decades. And it is the ideology that has taken over most of our major institutions. This is why we saw the specter last week of an admiral in the United States Navy explaining why he had recommended that sailors be reading Ibram X. Kendi, who's one of the great race grifters and racists of our time. It's the reason why there are corporations all over America training their workers that if they are white, they suffer from inevitable whiteness. And this inevitable whiteness is in fact a symptom of discrimination. And so they have to do the work, do the work in order to be properly woke and in order to properly address their own flaws, these inherent flaws in them. Not that they've done anything bad in their life, but because of their whiteness, they are bad. This is why you see corporations giving money to things like Ibram X. Kennedy Center. That's why you see Jack Dorsey of Twitter giving $10 million to Ibram X. Kennedy Center for anti-racist research, which to date has produced no actual research. It's the reason why you see the media consistently using the language of CRT, always using the language of equity rather than the language of equality. The language of equality is in the Declaration of Independence. It's in the Constitution. The language of equity is not because equity is a mush term that in modern parlance has come to mean equal outcome rather than actual fairness. Right? Fairness, typically speaking, if you go back to the ancients, the idea is fairness is you get what you deserve, right? Your action results in particular results. And this would be equity. This would be justice. That is not what the modern definition of equity means. The modern definition of equity means that no matter what your action, the outcome should always be the same. Because after all, the system is rigged against you. And failure is just a symptom that the system is rigged against you. The basic tenets of critical race theory have, in fact, been watered down and then spread like manure all the way through most of our major institutions, from corporate America to the media to academia, where it began, and certainly into the halls of government. And what you see from the media is an unwillingness to confront this or a willingness to champion it. The media's reaction on this has been utterly irresponsible because, of course, they are proponents of CRT. CRT is not merely a legal theory. It started off as a legal theory, sort of like intersectionality started off as a legal theory. And then it became an actual activist point. This happens in politics all the time, by the way. There are kind of highfalutin theories, and then they are kind of dehydrated and dehydrated more and dehydrated more to the point where they become a pill. And then all you do is you take the pill and now you have become sort of an advocate for that ideology. And the game that people like to play is that after people take that pill and you get the inevitable results of that pill, then they say, well, you know, that really has nothing to do with the original ideology, right? This is just a boiling down of that. But here is the reality. The reality is that CRT was corrupt and wrong in its first instance. And that the logical progression of CRT, what we are seeing now is in fact connected to critical race theory. So I'm going to start today by going through what exactly critical race theory is in the words of some of the creators of critical race theory. And then we're going to show you how the media boil this down and how terrible it is for America because they are actively spreading this stuff. And the reason that I'm bringing this up is because yesterday, 
I was browsing in advance of the show. And I noticed that the front page of the Washington Post, like the front page of the Washington Post, had this video on it. Okay, And the, the title on the video, it's from some new show they call The Lily, is what is white racial identity and why is it important? And the first thing that occurred to me when I saw this, by the way, is that video that was put out by the comedian. Uh, they, I'm trying to remember his name. Ryan something. That video in which it showed a woke person and a racist person, and it turns out they agreed on everything. Okay, because how else do you get a headline from the Washington Post that says, what is white racial identity and why is it important? Is at the very top of the Washington Post page. And it was connected to a five-minute video about basically why you are, if you are white, you are inevitably guilty, and you are responsible to, for evil, citizen, evil systems that are promulgated throughout American life and that result in inequity. The video is, is amazing. So we're going to start, before we get to the video, with an explanation of what CRT is. And then you'll see how it has been basically rebranded, repackaged, gussied up, and then just shoved in your face via places like the Washington Post. Okay, so here are the basic tenets of critical race theory. Okay, Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanczyk were two of the founders of critical race theory in the late 1970s. Okay, so what I'm about to quote is from their book, Critical Race Theory, an introduction. And the reason I'm doing this is because one of the games that the media love to play is when you say critical race theory, they will say, what do you even mean by critical race theory? What I mean is exactly what the founders of critical race theory are saying. How about that? And okay, what I mean by critical race theory is exactly what critical race theory is. I don't mean what the media say that it is because they lie about it. I don't mean what people who don't know a critical race theory say that it is, say that it is. A okay, critical race theory was like assigned reading when I was at Harvard Law School. This was a well-respected branch of thought at Harvard Law School when I was there. And that was all the way back in 2007, I graduated. And so here is some of what they say, Delgado and Stefanczyk, in Critical Race Theory and Introduction. Quote, although critical race theory began as a movement in the law, it has rapidly spread beyond that discipline. Okay, so this gives the lie that you'll sometimes hear from people in the media. Well, you know, it was just a legal way of looking at things. It really has nothing to do with the activism we see it wrong. Okay, even the founders of that movement understand that it is a movement. It's like most things in life. It started as an academic theory and then eventually turned into a political activist movement. And Marxism originally started as an academic theory, and then it turned into a politically activist movement that resulted in the slaughter of, you know, 100 million people. Okay, so it turns out a lot of ideological movements eventually turn out to be practical political movements. So here's what they write. Although critical race theory began as a movement in the law, it has rapidly spread beyond that discipline. Today, many in the field of education consider themselves critical race theorists who use CRT's ideas to understand issues of, social, of school discipline and hierarchy, tracking controversies over curriculum and history and IQ and achievement testing. Political scientists ponder voting strategies coined by critical race theorists. Ethnic studies courses often include a unit on critical race theory, and American studies departments teach material on critical white studies developed by CRT writers. Unlike some academic disciplines, critical race theory contains an activist dimension. Again, this is the founders admitting this is an activist ideology. It not only tries to understand our social situation, but to change it. It sets out not only to ascertain how society organizes itself along racial lines and hierarchies, but to transform it for the better. And remember, it's not me saying it. These are the founders of critical race theory saying this. It is an activist ideology designed to tear away at the systems of the United States. And they're bragging that it has spread into every major discipline in the United States. So it's not the right that's claiming this. This is not some sort of chimera. It's not a figment of our imagination. The people who founded it brag openly about how this ideology has spread throughout our institutions. Everything from testing philosophy with regard to educational movements, to how people vote, right? All of that has been bled in with regard to CRT. So what are the principles of critical race theory? So there are essentially four laid out by Delgado and Stefanczyk in this particular book. There are two that pretty much everybody agrees on, and then there are two that are kind of argued about because they're in direct conflict with one another. Okay, so the first two that everybody agrees about are, quote, first, that racism is ordinary, not aberrational. Normal science, the usual way society does business, the common everyday experience of most people of color in this country. Right, so that means that you are racist even if you don't know you're racist because the systems are racist and you are shaped by the systems. Racism is not an aberration. You can't point to that guy over there and say, ah, that guy's a racist because he says racist stuff. No, that's not how racism is defined. Racism is just the water in which we swim. Racism is the air that we breathe. Everything that surrounds us, the miasmatic substances that surround us and in which we live our lives, those are where racism lives. Racism is ordinary the way that breathing air is ordinary and drinking water is ordinary. Right? It's normal science. Second, 
Most would agree that our system of white over color ascendancy serves important purposes, both psychic and material. The first feature, ordinariness, means that racism is difficult to cure or address. Okay, this is one of the key tenets of critical race theory. It's very, very difficult to fight racism. Very difficult. Now, the reason they say this is not because they actually want to fight racism. The reason they say this is because their entire proposition is that you cannot fight racism at an individual level. If you call out a racist incident, you have not helped fight racism. The only way to fight racism is to search within your own heart. And even then, it's really not within your own heart because you may have nothing but good intentions. You really have to search inside your own adherence to your environment, right? You have to search inside your own adherence to American systems. Everything must be leveled. Everything must be torn out by the roots. That's how you fight racism. And this is central to their theory. It means that racism is difficult to cure or address. Colorblind or formal conceptions of equality expressed in rules that insist only on treatment that is the same across the board can thus remedy only the most blatant forms of discrimination, such as mortgage redlining or the refusal to hire a black PhD rather than a white high school dropout that do stand out and attract our attention. And so here is where we immediately start sliding into if there is no equal outcome, then some sort of deep inequity has been done. Right? They're saying that if you fight racism by pointing out that a black PhD should get the math job over the white high school dropout, that's not actually fighting racism. It doesn't do any good because racism is hard to fight and that would be easy. And it's one of the games that the CRT advocates like to play is refusal to define terms. They like to be deliberately vague. The vaguer they are, the more they can claim that you are failing to achieve their purposes. See, when you give people the idea that they get to go ghost hunting, that basically the way you fight racism is, is not to fight actual on the ground racism, it's to actually ghost hunt. Then no matter what they do, you can say they've not achieved it. No matter what racism they have fought, no matter what racism they oppose, you can say, well, it doesn't matter. Because you see, it's very difficult to fight racism. And you haven't internalized that battle yet. Okay, this is why critical race theory, in essence, is just a cult. You are supposed to follow whatever the cult leaders tell you. And if you don't follow what the cult leaders tell you, they will tell you that you have not been sufficiently loyal to the cause of anti-racism. Here we get to more from the authors of critical race theory. And I'm quoting the people who write this stuff. I'm not making it up. I'm quoting it to you because, and the reason I'm doing this again is because the media lie and they say that if you are critical of critical race theory, it's because you haven't done the reading. Okay, I'm reading you the reading. So now you've done the reading. I'll get to that in just one second. First, let's talk about protecting your home. So there are a thousand reasons why protecting my home matters to me. If somebody stops by or something is going on outdoors around the house, Ring will let me know. It's peace of mind anytime knowing that my home is protected. At my house, I can keep an eye on every corner of the house with Ring. It's easy to install indoor and outdoor cams. I'll tell you, this comes in handy like every single day. So I have three kids. They're constantly running around my house. Right? It, the little one, you know, because she's a, a small child, she's like a year and a half old. She's just learned to walk and she's constantly bumping into things. If I lose her for like half a second, she might be doing something to get herself in trouble. I rely on my ring devices to let me know where she is at all times. Because if I look away for one second, she might be gone. This is why I love ring. To get ring alarm for yourself, go to ring.com forward slash men. It is the perfect way to start your ring experience. Besides ring being a powerful asset for my home, Ring is also an affordable whole home security system you can easily install yourself. It's never been more important to be able to see who's there or what's happening anytime around the house, inside or outside, and I can see it all in one simple app. That's right, with Ring, my family and I can keep an eye on our home no matter where we are right from our phone. How great to know you're not going to miss a visitor with Ring's hassle-free, easy to install indoor and outdoor cams and know when those packages are delivered. And keep an eye on your kids. Start protecting your home today with Ring Alarm. Go to ring.com slash Ben. Get your Ring Alarm security kit today. Build the system that's right for your home. Have it up and running in just minutes. That's ring.com slash Ben. Again, ring.com slash Ben. Go check them out right now. All righty. So Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanczyk continue in critical race theory and introduction. So we've already established a few key principles here. Okay, one, racism is ordinary, not aberrational. Two, white over color ascendancy serves important purposes. Okay, what they say here, is that this second principle, white over color ascendancy serves important purpose, uh, purposes. This actually is deeply tied into policy. They say this second feature, sometimes called interest convergence or material determinism, adds a further dimension. Because racism advances the interests of both white elites material or materially and working class people psychically, large segments of society have little incentive to eradicate it. Okay, so the idea here is that racism, again, is all around you and it serves you. You may think that you're against racism. You're not. You're happy about racism because if you're an elite, it serves you materially. The system serves you as an elite. The system serves you. The system is racist. Therefore, you are racist in upholding the system. If you are a poor white person, you are still privileged by the system because you psychically get to look at all these people of color and say those people of color are less than I am. And therefore, I have more common cause with the white elite than I do with the people who are of my own class. 
Now, you may notice the Marxist tinge here, right? Because now we're talking about class differentiation and why really people should have class solidarity rather than racial solidarity. Now, you can see that the Marxist dimension has started to slip in here because as we'll explain in just a second, critical race theory isn't a neo-Marxist movement. It is an offshoot of critical theory, which is in and of itself a, a Marxist movement. Okay. So what are the effects of this? Okay, so Derek Bell, who's again a major critical race theorist, we'll get to more on him in a second. He had a shocking proposal that Brown versus Board of Education, for example, right? That is one of the great anti-racist moments in American history of an actual Supreme Court decision saying that under the Constitution of the United States, it is illegal for blacks and whites to be forced into separate schools. Derek Bell says that this just promulgated more racism. He says that the Brown versus Board of Education considered a great triumph of civil rights litigation may have resulted more from the self-interest of elite whites than a desire to help blacks. Okay, so these are the first two themes, and these are the ones that everybody kind of agrees on. One is that racism is ordinary, not aberrational. And the second is that that ordinariness serves important psychic and material purposes for white people, right? Your whiteness makes you enjoy the racism of the system. Okay, then we get to two principles of CRT that are sort of in conflict with one another. And, and when I say sort of, I mean almost directly in opposition to one another. According to Delgado and Stefanczyk, a third theme of critical race theory, the social construction thesis, holds that race and races are products of social thought and relations not objective, inherent, or fixed. They correspond to no biological or genetic reality. Ra rather, races are categories that so society invents, manipulates, or retires when convenient. Okay, so then you might say, okay, well, that, that sounds more like, you know, the Martin Luther King thing. Okay, so if, if race is a social construction, then we really should attempt to see beyond race. We should see individuals as individuals. Okay, but no, this is not what critical race theorists argue. Instead, they argue the systems of power are racist, and they have made up race as a social construct in order to damn other people. But the way that you get beyond that is not by seeing beyond race. The way that you get beyond that is by embracing race, Okay, which brings us to the fourth thesis, which is in direct conflict with the third th thesis. The fourth thesis is the notion of a unique voice of color. Coexisting in somewhat uneasy tension with anti-essentialism, the voice of color thesis holds that because of their different histories and experiences with oppression, black, Indian, Asian, and Latino writers and thinkers may be able to communicate to their white counterparts matters that the whites are unlikely to know. Minority status, in other words, brings with it a presumed competence to speak about race and racism. The legal storytelling movement urges black and brown writers to recount their experiences with racism in the legal system and to apply their own unique perspectives to assess laws, master narratives. Okay, this is where you get into the superiority of the of the perspective of people of color. Right? White people can't talk about this stuff. They're presumed incompetent to talk about this stuff. Now, you may say, wait a second, I thought that race was a social construct. Ah, but no, because in essence, this fourth thesis is more important than the third thesis. There is racial essentialism. If you are white, you suffer from whiteness. If you're a person of color, you have a presumed superiority to speak about racism, and we must listen to your perspectives on the system. Now, all of this is the outgrowth of critical theory. Critical theory is a branch of thought that began in the early 20th century with something called the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School posited basically that systems of power and hierarchy throughout the world were in fact covers for discrimination and cruelty. And thus, we had to be super critical about all of those systems of power. It was a Marxist theory that basically said that everything bad in Nazi Germany was a product of capitalism. Everything in America, the, the Frankfurt theorists actually openly said that America in the 1950s was proto-fascist, that it was going to lead to Nazi Germany, which is, of course, insane. They were Marxists. So of course, they believed that. A critical theory is, is a sort of neo-Marxist movement in which power defines everything, right? Which, as you can see, bled, the, the only difference between sort of critical theory and critical race theory, you can see the similarity in the names, is the word race. Right? Instead of saying that all of the systems of power are, are created in order to help the upper class, which is sort of what critical theory posits, Critical race theory posits that all of the systems of power were created in order to help people of specific races. Okay, which is why there is pretty heavy crossover. So Derek Bell, who I mentioned earlier, again, one of the founders of critical race theory and a man who Barack Obama famously hugged in the 1980s as he was trying to preserve his tenure at Harvard Law School, despite having done very little academic work. Derek Bell wrote the whole liberal worldview of private rights and public sovereignty mediated by the rule of law needed to be exploded. A worldview premised upon the public and private spheres is an attractive mirage that masks the reality of economic and political power. All right, so what is the end goal of critical race theory, according to people like Derek Bell? Explode the system. The end goal is to teach everybody that they are the products of a corrupt system. The only way to extirpate and expurgate your own whiteness is to involve yourself in this great task of exploding the system. Ideas of private and public rights. The idea of liberal worldviews in which you have the right to freedom of speech or the 
right to own your own property. All of these things lead to discrimination and not, not only lead to them, spring from a desire to uphold discrimination. This is the fundamental political theory of critical race theory. Okay, so all of this is the lead up to how the media present this stuff. Okay, so the way that the media present this stuff is as a way to fight racism. So they discovered that using the term critical race theory is actually not particularly helpful because people look at it and they go, wait, this sounds like super stupid and racist. This sounds like you want to tear down the most successful systems that have ever been created for creating the possibility of prosperity, wealth, equality, right? You want to get rid of those. It sounds like you want to explode those. Why would we possibly listen to you? So instead, they come with this new rubric and the new rubric is this is anti-racism. So what they do is they take critical race theory's idea of race which is that it is implicit in everything. And then they say, in order to be anti-racist, you have to tear down the systems. So they've shifted the definition of racism from stuff that we all understood to be racism, namely a belief in the superiority or inferiority of an individual based on their racial characteristics. They took that, they trashed it. And they said, no, that's not what real racism is. Real racism is believing in the system. So anti-racism would be destroying the system. So under that rubric of quote unquote anti-racism, they've started to infiltrate all of the major institutions. The word racism is such a powerful word in American public life because of the true and vicious history of racism in the United States that if you can hijack that word and if you can morph that word into a code word for the system and tearing down the system, if you can do all of that, you've achieved unbelievable things on behalf of the left that wishes to destroy all of those systems in the name of some sort of greater equity. And this is exactly what the Washington Post proposes to do. Now, to normal people who watch this stuff, it looks like gobbledygook. You watch this and you're like, I don't understand what in the F you are talking about. And when we watch this Washington Post video together, which again is about five minutes long, when we watch that together and listen to it, you'll see it makes no sense. Nobody bothers to define their terms. These folks sound as though they are cult members trying to explain the cult to other people. It sounds weird and bizarre. It sounds vague and unpractical, but that is the whole purpose. The whole purpose is in order for you to be a member of the elect, a member of the political and intellectual elite, you have to buy into a system. It is all about social virtue signaling. You wonder what people are learning in colleges these days? They're not learning about American history for sure. Instead, what they are learning is how to speak this language because this is the key into the elite in modern American society. It's the key to institutional power in American society because the woke run the place now. In just one second, I'm gonna go through this video because it really is indicative of where we are in the debate and why there is blowback right now. Well-justified blowback first. Let us talk about why you don't want to go to the auto parts store. Because who wants to go to the auto parts store? You're going to stand in line for like 15 minutes. Then you're going to get to the front of the line. You're going to answer a bunch of questions. And then the guy behind the counter is going to be like, oh, I don't have that part in stock. What if I just order it for you online and upcharge you by 30%? Or you could just go to the interwebs because the interwebs is a magical place. Go to rockauto.com. Rockauto.com is so much easier than walking into a store and someone demanding quick answers to things like, is your Odyssey an LX or an EX? And then they usually just have to order the part online anyway because there are so many types of cars, it's impossible to keep them all stocked. Instead, rockauto.com offers the lowest prices possible rather than changing prices based on what the market will bear like airlines do. Why spend up to twice as much for the same parts? Their family business serving auto parts customers online for 20 years. Go to rockauto.com to shop for auto and body parts from hundreds of manufacturers. The catalog's unique. It's remarkably easy to navigate. You can quickly see all the parts available for your vehicle. Choose the brand's specifications, prices you prefer. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck. Write Shapiro in there. How did you hear about us, Box? So they know that we sent you. Get that car fixed up the right way at rockauto.com. Write Shapiro in there. How did you hear about us, Box? So they know that we sent you. Okay, finally, this brings us to the Washington Post's Understanding Your Whiteness video. And it's all about understanding your whiteness. And truly, this is racist crap because... As you may have noticed, the notion of racial essentialism, that your racial characteristics define you and define your perspective, is racism. The notion that we ought to treat you as superior or inferior in your outlook on the world based on your race is, in fact, the classical definition of racism. But it's now anti-racism because it's directed against destroying the quote-unquote racist systems. Okay, so this comes out as a weird bunch of gobbledygook nonsense. I'm going to try and translate it for you here. Here's the Washington Post lead story yesterday, again, from Washington Post The Lily. Racism, racialization, white body supremacy is not episodic, it's structural. Remember that there were um, thousands of George Floyd before the one that you saw. Your bodily response to this, this horror, right, is not the same thing as you dealing with the structural aspects of this. George Floyd's death became a deeply personal and racial tragedy for many Americans. 
For the first time, white people were becoming aware of their whiteness and the systemic ways that white supremacy affects all of us. White people in particular get aroused, get upset, say this is unjust, this isn't right, this shouldn't happen. There's like an awakening that happens. And so part of their racial identity development is seeing that awakening. What they do with it is really the next piece of it. In this episode, we're tackling white racial identity and why understanding your whiteness is integral to becoming self-aware as a white person. I'm Nicole Ellis, and this is The New Okay, pause it there for a second. Alrighty, so understanding your white identity. Now, you may have thought to yourself, I don't really have a white identity. Like for me, I'd be considered white by these folks. I'm Jewish. My identity is many different things, but kind of in terms of ethnicity, it's more Jewish because that actually connects to how I act in the real world. And, and honestly, I don't care about ethnicity. So my Jewish ethnic identity is really only tied into the fact that as the son of a Jewish mother, I am religiously Jewish, right? By that law. But my ethnicity really has nothing to do with it. And the idea of a general white identity is also very weird because the only aspect of quote unquote white identity is generally in American history in opposition to quote unquote black identity or Asian identity or Mexican identity. But the reality is that for the vast majority of history and including American history, people didn't see themselves in terms of white identity. Okay, they saw themselves in terms of sort of where they came from. There was Irish identity. There was Italian identity. There was Czech identity. There was Jewish identity. There was Russian identity. And if you go to Europe today, trying to say to an Italian, you have white identity, they'd be like, what? I'm Italian. What are you talking about? Like Brits and Italians, they have different cultural heritages because culture is not the same as ethnicity. The attempt to cudgel everybody who is not a person of color into the white identitarian category is an awkward one and is, in fact, a social construction. But for these folks, like Nicole Ellis of the Washington Post, it is important that you understand your white identity. What they mean is they're going to cudgel you into an identity where you are responsible for all the evils of the world. You're responsible for the George Floyd situation. Hey, first of all, when Resma Menachem at the very beginning, an author, when he says at the beginning, there are thousands of George Floyds you never saw. Well, I mean... Under what time context are we talking? Are we talking like the last several hundred years? Because then that's true. Are you talking about like the last several years? The answer, of course, is no. The number of black unarmed men killed in the United States by cops is under 20 every single year. So no, it's not thousands of people who are being treated the way that George Floyd was treated. Okay, but again, the, the idea is that pointing out that incident which again, was not even like, there's still no evidence. It's amazing how this has been promulgated. There's still no evidence that was a racist incident. It was not alleged in court. It was not alleged by the federal government. It's been alleged by no one. And yet that has become the racial incident in America, despite the fact that there's no racial animus sought. Why? Because it's structural. You've heard that word structural. And the idea again is that in reality, Derek Chauvin isn't really, according to CRT, even to blame for Derek Chauvin's activity. Derek Chauvin is just an agent of the structure and the structure is to blame. And you are both to blame for upholding the structure and you are a symptom of that structure because you were created by that structure. Okay, let's continue with this Washington Post video. It says, why is white racial identity important? I am originally from a smaller town in Oklahoma. Whiteness was the default and whiteness was the comfort. Part of the structure of racism and the way that it's maintained is to keep us from recognizing that racism is a part of our daily lives. And so it's a longer term process of looking at your understanding of yourself in the world, both historically, but also contextually, the family you live in, the community you live in, and what role whiteness plays in that. So here you have a woman named Kelsey Arias originally saying that whiteness was her default and her comfort. I don't know what that's supposed to mean, other than this is her confessing her sins in Maoist style, right? She didn't know she was racist, but it was her default and her comfort. She didn't even know. She didn't even know what kind of sin she was committing, but she was by dint of just where she lived. And then you have Rebecca Tobarak, who is one of these authors who was speaking before, saying that, you know, finding your whiteness and discovering your own sin is a lifelong process. Now, that sounds very much, again, like cultic language. It sounds like a cult. It sounds like you have to spend your entire life cleansing yourself of whatever the master says is your sin. You have to spend your entire, it's a lifelong process of discovering your own whiteness and looking within. Or, and what exactly are you hunting for? The answer is you're hunting for whatever I tell you to hunt for. You're hunting for your own unconscious racial bias that has infused the core of your very being. 
And the, and the only, and if you can't uncover it, it's because you're racist, obviously. Right? This is the perfect Kafka trap. If you say, well, I looked inside myself and I really don't think I'm a racist. They say, ah, it's because you are so infused with your own racism, you can't even recognize your own racism. Pretty incredible stuff. This nonsense continues. The more you kind of dive into that, the more I'm really realizing how deeply rooted racism is into like my everyday thought process. No matter how much you work at that, there's still even almost more work to be done. A living embodied anti-racist culture does not exist among white people. White people got to start getting together specifically around race. White accountability groups are really helpful in terms of having a place to process, having a group of people whose responsibility it is to call me on things or to challenge me. We're unpacking wrong things that we've been taught in history class. I realized that I needed to go back and unpack and reorganize everything that I had learned because it was completely Okay, true. stop for a second. Okay, so the, so Washington Post recognizes and they, they, they suggest that you should create an accountability group. This is direct malice crap. Okay, like direct malice crap. So over the weekend, I was reading a book about the current, what they call third revolution in China, the Xi Jinping revolution. And what they've done at many of their companies is they have these sort of political groups where you're supposed to get together. And this has been true for decades, really since the inception of Maoism. But now it's sort of moved into the corporate sphere over there. The, you're supposed to have these accountability groups where you get together and you confess your sins against Marxism. Right? They would actually have Maoist struggle sessions during the time of Mao where you would do this. You'd get up and you'd confess your sins. And you were forced to do this. And this has been true in every communist country. Right? Pol Pot used to have these things where you'd get up and you'd confess your sins against Marxism. And then you would be punished for it. And then you would sit back down. So they're now suggesting that in exactly the same fashion, we have, quote unquote, accountability groups. You have white people get together and call each other out on their racism and then presumably forgive each other. And the more you confess, the more praiseworthy you are. The more you say, I, I, this is why you see Rebecca Toporak in this video saying things like, well, you know, the, you, you almost never finish the work. It's almost impossible to finish the work. You can never get to the end of the work. Or Kelsey Arias saying, I've never even discovered the, the depth of my own racism. I was never able to come up with the depth of my own racism. Or at least Kennedy saying, I have to go back. This is where it starts to get institutional. We have to go back and we have to see the way we teach history. And we have to reteach ourselves history this way. And here you start to see the creep over from these sort of personal browbeating and the self-scourging, the 12th century style self-scourging and, and Maoist style struggle sessions to now we have to teach how we, how we teach it. We have to change how we teach this stuff in schools to children. Okay, let's continue. Completely through a white lens. Most of us in doing this work have experienced this where there's a period of deep shame for being white and for acknowledging the harm that our ancestors have caused. And that's a very legitimate piece of this work. And we can't ask people of color to hold our hands through the shame piece. That needs to happen with other white people. When you do that for one, two, three, four, five years, right? you end up with actually a community that is aligned with each other. In theory, that sounds like a good idea, but I guess I'm curious to hear, like, what are some of the pitfalls or risks that you run if that's the only step you take? The biggest answer is white people don't really understand racism. <laughs> and so if I'm relying on other white people to teach me about racism, that can only go so far. I only best understand racism by talking to people who are directly impacted by racism from different perspectives. So in addition to having white accountability groups and white accountability buddies, it's also really important to have sustained and meaningful relationships with people of color. I okay, pause it there. Okay, so this is Rebecca Toporek and all the rest of these people suggesting they can't even understand racism, right? It's so deeply rooted in them, they feel shame. They feel shame at their own whiteness. So first of all, if you feel shame because of your race, this is racist. You should not feel shame under any circumstances because of a condition that you were born into. That's insane. Okay, that's the definition of racism, truly. If you feel ashamed because you were born black, we would say, oh my God, that's terrible. Why would you feel ashamed for being born black? But now the idea is there's something good about feeling ashamed for being a white person. Why? Did you do something wrong? Normally shame attaches when you do something wrong. But the idea is that by the very color of your skin, you are complicit in this racist system because the system benefits you even unconsciously. And so you can't even fight racism, right? This goes back to the critical race theory principles that we were talking about, right? The critical race theory principles, one of them is that white people can't even properly understand race, only black people. 
and only Hispanic people and only Asian people, and even there is a hierarchy there, only people who are not white can properly understand racism. So now the Washington Post says you need to find a black friend. Now, recognize that you are also in the same video. They're saying that if you ask a black person to guide you on racism, this is in and of itself racist because you are assuming that that person has either the wherewithal or the desire to tell you about racism. It's using that black person as sort of a token to lead you. But you have to find black friends because those black friends are the only ones who are capable of awakening you to your own racism and to your own complicity in the system. This is all cultic nonsense. It's all cultic behavior and it's infused everything. Continue. You don't have the ability to like inherently name things as upholding white supremacy or as being racist. My whiteness is going to show up at different points in my life and at different points in different relationships. But is it fair or healthy to be seeking out relationships with people just to have a diverse network? Because I feel like for people of color, you're kind of constantly trying to gauge whether or not it's worth it to be vulnerable or share how someone hurt you when your white colleagues or co coworkers or friends mess up. There's a different cost for my friends of color to be in relationship with me. So I think one of the things that's really important is ongoing being a friend on an ongoing basis for lots of different things, not just like thinking about racism as a part of our friendship when there's something horrible that happens. Those relationships are number one for me to um, be there for them as them for me it's a it's a relationship and so it should be reciprocal but also so that i have a broader understanding of the world everything i thought about how i existed in my white body in the world was very wrong <laughs> and i needed this new lens to see the world through so i think that's been a big piece of my own work incredible and Nicole Ellis is sitting there like, but so black people shouldn't be friends with you because then they're going to be used as tokens. And like, well, they won't be used as tokens. I mean, we'll still be friends, but we'll kind of use them as tokens. But we're helping to reexamine our own prejudices. And Nicole Ellis is sitting there like the judge on high trying to judge all these white people, right? I mean, that's that she's there to provide them the absolution. Okay, this is racist nonsense. It's being taught to your kids in school. It's being pushed by the Washington Post on their front page. And the Washington Post, now the left is angry that you caught them. Okay, because here's the reality. There's pushback, and the pushback is incredibly serious. We're seeing a bevy of states push actions to ban the teaching of critical race theory in schools, which is good. Okay, critical race theory, schools have to decide what they teach to kids. They don't teach kids that two plus two equals five because that's a waste of time, stupid, counterproductive, and illogical. You shouldn't be teaching kids about racial essentialism. You shouldn't be teaching kids that all the systems of power in the United States are racist. You shouldn't be teaching kids that by dint of their very skin color, they ought to feel shame. You shouldn't teach kids false notions of American history because that's a garbage thing to do. And you're starting to see blowback on this. And the left, which has embraced all of this, right? The left loves this stuff. Right? Joe Biden's administration agrees with this Washington Post video. I dare you to find a single member of the Washington, uh, of, honestly, of the Biden administration who would dare to say that this video is the pretentious, crappy, self-defeating nonsense that it is. You wouldn't find one person in the entire administration who would say that, not one. So the blowback and the blowback is coming and the blowback is very, very real. And the left is very upset about it. It is not a coincidence that the same day that the Washington Post ran this particular video, the Washington Post also ran a very long piece being very angry that anybody, including Christopher Rufo, who's one of the people leading the charge, has been fighting back against critical race theory. And this is precisely the point. The left has been renormalizing America by pushing radical ideas slowly into the mainstream by being intransigent and very, very loud inside specific institutions. Okay, they push a little bit and then they push a lot, but they continue to push and they are very intransigent and they hope that by bullying you into silence and feel and making you feel shame for your own race and making you feel shame for your own systems and making you feel shame for America, and they can shut you up and then take over the institutions. And what's happening right now is that that vast middle is saying no. All it takes to quote unquote renormalize and already renormalize institutions is a bunch of people in the middle saying absolutely not, we're not doing this. And this is why the left is getting pissed because a bunch of people who are heretofore silent, a bunch of people who are very quiet up to this point, they're now standing up and they're taking back their school boards. They're standing up and they're retaking their legislatures. They're standing up and they're retaking congressional seats and they're saying no. And the left can't handle it because for a long time, 20% of the country has run the other 80% of the country. And now there's a vast swath in the middle who are saying, no, we're not going to do this stuff, which is phenomenal. And the first step on that is awareness of the fact that this 20% of people, these radicals, 
who have created this coalition in order to push this nonsense, have started to take over the institutions and in many cases have already have, have done that. You can renormalize as long as you have a core percentage on the other side of 20 percent and the and the 60 percent in the middle, the unaligned side with the 20 percent pushback rather than the 20 percent radicals who are pushing this stuff in the first place. That's how renormalization happens. And it's already happening. And it's great to watch. And the left is scared out of their wits. We'll get to more of this in just one second. First, let's talk about the fact that thieves could come after your most valuable asset. Okay, the reality is your most valuable asset is probably your home title. That's pretty much true for everybody. Can people actually steal your home title? The answer is yes. Take it from this thief who stole over 150 homes and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. This right here is why you need home title lock. Nobody thinks that I can take their house and borrow against the house. Oh, no, I have title insurance for that. No, it's, it's in my name or he would have to get some special document. They would call me. You know, nobody's calling you. After I've stolen the title, borrowed against it, or sold the property, or done whatever I've done with it, it's 60 to 90 days to even figure out that, that they're the victim of this crime. You know, by that point, you start getting foreclosure notices, and you realize you've got four mortgages on your house. Not only that, you don't even own your home anymore. It's not even in your name. If you've heard enough, you should head on over to HomeTitleLock.com, register your address, see if you're already a victim, enter code RADIO. For 30 free days of protection, that is code radio at hometitlelock.com. Again, that's code radio at hometitlelock.com. Protect your most valuable asset, that home title. All right, we'll get to more of this in just one second. First, if you've been paying attention to the left's weaponization of the dictionary, you'll have noticed the accepted language now changes as quickly as a car changes lanes. History has demonstrated that when a political party takes control of the language, things do not end well, which is why Michael Knowles wrote, speechless, controlling words, controlling minds in it. He not only writes words in a book, he also breaks down the history of political correctness and what the future will resemble if that is not stopped. So if you haven't been to the bookstore lately, now is the time. Speechless will be available in bookstores tomorrow, Tuesday, June 22nd. That is not all. Michael will be doing a live book signing tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 6.30 p.m. Central at dailywire.com, Daily Wire YouTube, and Daily Wire Facebook. So if you want a signed copy, just head to premiercollectibles.com slash speechless before the signing order one. Don't forget to type your question into the prompter when you check out. Then tune into his live signing and watch to see if he answers your question during the live stream. If he does not, don't worry, you will still get your signed copy. So get ready for an interesting live stream, some excellent writing, and finally, an ability to understand the PC police better than they understand themselves, which is basically, in this day and age, a superpower once again. It's premiercollectibles.com slash speechless to get your signed copy. Tune in tomorrow, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 6.30 p.m. Central at dailywire.com, Daily Wire YouTube, Daily Wire Facebook, and watch Michael's live signing again. I'd never say anything good about Michael Moles because not only is that a principle, but it is a truth. But Speechless is actually a really good book and you should get a copy today. Also, if you've been enjoying Candace's new show as much as you enjoy the fact that she trends every single day on Twitter, I've got some excellent news for you. If you're a Daily Wire All Access member, you can now be part of her live studio audience at the Daily Wire headquarters in Nashville, Tennessee. If you're lucky, you might be one of the few whose mugs get seen by all her viewers. Hurry though, because seating is limited. Tickets are sold on a first come first serve basis. If you live in Nashville or you've been planning on taking a trip there, which is totally worth it. Nashville is awesome. Now is indeed the time. Tickets are being sold for 20 bucks each. Head on over to dailywire.com slash tickets today to pick yours up. You're listening to the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. All right, so the pushback to critical race theory has begun. Christopher Rufo is one of the lead researchers on that particular issue. He now works over at the Manhattan Institute and, uh, and he has a book out coming out pretty soon with, uh, with Harper which, uh, full disclosure, is also my publisher. And he's been pushing into sort of common parlance critical race theory. You know, it's been used as the, the term that was used before critical race theory was wokeism. Critical race theory is, is more specific because it actually goes to the ideological roots of all of this. Well, those, the, the root of the, of the pushback has now created fruit. And you're seeing it all over, right? So you're seeing videos, like here, here's one that, that went viral, of a father and daughter, a black father and daughter, pushing back against critical race theory. It was an excellent video. And the reason... It, it is so telling is because because critical race theory suggests that all the systems of America are deeply racist and inherently directed at promoting the subservience of black Americans, particularly. It means that you're basically saying black people, they have no agency. They have no agency in America in the freest country in the history of the world with the richest black families on planet Earth on average. They have no agency whatsoever. And so here is a young black man named Corey Yeshua and his six year old daughter royalty pushing back on critical race theory and saying this is nonsense and it hurts black people, which it absolutely does. Depriving people of agency is the worst single thing you can do to anyone in life. It is the worst thing. When you tell people they have no agency in their own life, you cannot do anything worse to a child than that, truly. And when you do, when you create actions that give them no agency, obviously, 
That is an extension of that very idea. Anyway, here was a Corey Eshwood. This went completely viral, of course. Daddy teaches you can be anything in this world that you want to be, right? Don't daddy teach you that? Yeah, and it doesn't matter if, if you're black or white or any color. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, brown, yellow. Yellow. Right? Black. And, and how we treat people is based on who yeah. they are and not and what color nice. they are. And if they're nice and smart. See? This is, how, this is how children think right here. Critical race theory wants to end that. Not with my children. It's not going to happen. Good for him, right? So this went viral. Hey, there's an Illinois dad who got up recently at a school board hearing, pushing against critical race theory. Again, black guy. And he said, this is, this is nonsense. He said, color was not discussed in my home at all. The only race it is is the human race. I, don't, I never raised my sons to see anybody as a color. Color was never even discussed in my house at all. All we know is that as my ch- as children grow, they just see other kids and they'll just immediately start playing. There is no a child see them and like, why is his skin color like that of mine? They, we never discussed that. When it all comes down to it, people are just people. My sons never had a talk about white people, about Asian people. All they know is that they were people. They were their friends. They played with them. They never once came home and said, Dad, my white friend across the street, that they just said my friends. Okay, and of course, this is exactly right. The pushback is happening. Even the the mainstream media, the reason that they are starting to get so worried about this and to lie about it is because they are deeply, deeply worried that the right is going to be able to mobilize on this because people in the middle, right, that unmotivated 60% in the middle are looking at the left and saying, what you're preaching right now is cultic, crazy garbage that tears away every system of freedom in the United States. Here's a PBS reporter fully acknowledging on national TV on Sunday that critical race theory is mobilizing people as well it should. Specific to this idea of critical race theory, I have to tell you, just spent some time reporting on this county in Virginia about an hour outside of Washington. And and to your point, this is something that is mobilizing people and resonating very deeply. It was about a 100 degree day, dozens and dozens and dozens of parents, mostly white in this largely affluent county, showed up to a school board meeting. For many of them, the very first school board meeting they'd ever attended, specifically because of this one issue. Okay, as well they should. The pushback has begun. Again, if you want to renormalize the institutions, if you want to make them normal again, then what you're going to have to do is stand up and say no. And people in the middle have to be made aware. They are aware now. They're waking up to it and they are fighting back. And this scares the living hell out of the left because this is the first institutional pushback that we have seen in America for quite some time against a systemic, motivated left. And it's great. The first thing you got to do is do what Rufo has done and others. We've done it on the show. Expose critical race theory for what it is. Number two, tell people they have to form coalitions with people who are in the middle and that those coalitions have to be mobilized against this very core, hardened group of people who are pushing a radical ideology and the institutions can, in fact, be taken back. I talk about this in my new book, The Authoritarian Moment, at length because it's really, really important. Okay, so meanwhile, the media is pushing back on all of this, right? And they're telling you lies about all of this. The media have decided that they are going to simply lie about what critical race theory is. So now, because there's a giant pushback, because Americans are pushing back against critical race theory, because finally, for the first time in a very long time, you have a large swath of Americans looking at a movement from the left that's now been promoted across the military, across your schools, across your your universities, and across your media, and in sports, and in every area of your life, because we have noticed it. The media has come up with two areas of pushback, because again, they are activists. Critical race theory, as the founders say, of critical race theory is not merely an idea, an ideology, or philosophy, it is, in fact, about activism. Quote, critical race theory contains an activist dimension. It not only tries to understand our social situation, but to change it. Richard Delgado, Gene Stefanczyk, critical race theory, introduction, right? This is their goal, is to change things. And many in the media have have drunk from the well. They've imbibed. They're infused with the spirit of critical race theory. So they've come back with two angles of pushback. Angle of pushback against the pushback, number one, is actually, actually, you just don't know what critical race theory is. And you've seen this over and over. So you saw Mark Lamont Hill, who is a radical idiot. He had on James Lindsay, and he started explaining to him, well, you know, let me me explain how this really isn't about Gramsci, and you haven't read enough Gramsci, and let me explain how it's really not about Delgado or Stefanczyk purely. It's about various other Marxist thinkers, and really has nothing to do with Marxism, even though everybody I'm quoting is a Marxist. And everybody's like, wow, that's it. He he knows critical... Okay, I just read you the tenets of critical race theory. Now you know the, the tenets of critical race theory. They... They, in their inception, were not vague. They've been made deliberately vague so that people who are criticized can then say, actually, you don't know even what you're talking about. Actually, you've never read any critical race theory. Actually, you are just saying something that is... Okay, so the way this is broadened out in the public view with regard to the media 
And you have members of the media saying, actually, critical race theory is just us teaching accurate history. Accurate history is just critical race theory. Okay, the answer is no, it's not. Because critical race theory, again, assumes that whiteness is pervasive everywhere, that white supremacy is pervasive in every institution, and that institutions and principles of power were created in order to reestablish and re-enshrine white supremacy. Okay, that's what critical race theory says. It's in its, its founding tenets. Okay, but what you get is from the media is if you push back against this, you get the coverage from the Washington Post. Okay, here's how the Washington Post covers the pushback against critical race theory. Quote, critical race theory holds that racism is systemic in the United States, not just a collection of individual prejudices, an idea that feels obvious to some and offensive to others. Rufo alleged that efforts to inject awareness of systemic racism and white privilege, which grew more popular following the murder of George Floyd by police, posed a grave threat to the nation. It's the latest cultural wedge issue, playing out largely but not exclusively in debate over schools. At its core, it pits progressives who believe white people should be pushed to confront systemic racism and white privilege in America against conservatives who see these initiatives as painting all white people as racist. Again, the way that the Washington Post is boiling this down is that if you believe that there is racism in America, then this means that you are a critical race theorist. Right. And, and that if you don't believe that, if you believe that there is no racism in America, you're a conservative. That, of course, is a great simplification. Okay, this is, but this is what CNN's Bakari Seller says. He says, if you're angry at critical race theory, it's just because you don't like regular history. You don't want to be taught regular history. Here he goes with Anderson Cooper. I think that critical race theory can go by another name, uh, America's history. It's amazing that we're having this discussion where we're celebrating Juneteenth, and now individuals don't want to teach us what led us up to Juneteenth. It's as if we want to keep a secret from our children that the founders of this country actually owned slaves. Um, you know, at what point will we be able to teach children that what happened six years ago yesterday in Charleston, South Carolina, was a white nationalist who walked into a church and murdered nine people? I mean, that is a part of America's history. OK, I have a question. You can teach all of those things to kids. And in fact, every single school child in America knows those things if they have been taught history at all in every state in America, that there was slavery in America and that many of the founders owned slaves. Yes, we all know that because that is part of American history. In fact, there was a giant, you may have missed it, there was a giant civil war where like hundreds of thousands of Americans died over exactly this question. And in fact, pretty much everybody understands that a white nationalist shot up a black church in South Carolina because we were all alive when that happened. But the basic idea here is that if you don't push the idea that every institution in America is rife with racism and you as a white person don't properly understand racism, this means that you're just not studying regular history. You get the same thing from the Washington Post, Jonathan Capehart. And here he was saying the same thing. It's, people are trying to stop us from learning history. So this is misdirect number one, is that if you hate racial critical, if you hate critical race theory because it's garbage, the real thing you're trying to do is stop people from learning history. It's a lie. The people who are trying to, you know, pushing back against, quote unquote, critical race theory, which is basically a blanket way of, of keeping us from recognizing, talking about and teaching the fullness of our history what they're doing is they're denying the country its full its full retelling. The United States is a is a great nation, and even though people are trying to keep us from learning our all of our history, Miss Opal Lee showed that it is possible to do things to make it possible so that the generations coming and the generations unborn get to know their entire history, warts and all. Okay, so this is misdirect number one. Is the critical race theory is just history? No, it's not. The people who, literally the people who wrote critical race theory say it's not just that, right? They say that Brown versus Board of Education, for example, is a racist institution designed to uphold white supremacy. Okay, that's what critical race theorist Derek Bell says. Okay, that's not teaching history, that's teaching garbage. Okay, so that's misdirect number one, is that if you don't like critical race theory, the pushback to the pushback. You don't like critical race theory, it's because you don't want to study history. Then there's pushback number two. Pushback number two is that critical race theory doesn't exist. Poof. It's in your imagination. And if you've noticed that all the theories of critical race theory have been entered into education, and if you've noticed that there are educational departments that explicitly say critical race theory is taught, if you noticed that there are, there are actual military departments that talk openly about critical race theory, if you've noticed that Robin DiAngelo is getting hired by your corporation or Ibram X. Kendi is being pushed by your corporation or that on your recommended book list from your toothbrush company is Ibram X. Kendi, if you've noticed any of this, it's because you're crazy. <laughs> It's all in your imagination. So Chuck Todd, again, this is you cannot trust your media because they lie to you because they are part of this institutional push. Here is Chuck Todd from MSNBC saying critical race theory. This is all a creation. It's just a creation. Let's take this 
uh, this so-called controversy over critical race theory. And I say so-called controversy because it's sort of, it's a creation that keeps people watching or keeps people clicking. And suddenly, you know, yada, 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 school board meetings are getting disrupted, right? Mm -hmm. And you're just sort of like, wait a minute, are you covering the news that people need to know? Yes, we are. You're not. You're downplaying it, basically pretending that none of this exists. Of course it exists. It exists in schools. We have private schools teaching it. We have public schools teaching it. And your job as the media is to expose that. And yet you say, well, that's not newsworthy. You know what's newsworthy? Whatever Donald Trump ate and crapped out today, that's newsworthy. What's truly newsworthy is a theory. We'll go for four years on Donald Trump as a Russian cat's paw, but we won't spend 30 seconds on most school boards in major metropolitan areas of the United States have taken up the rubric of anti-racism, which is really just a renaming of critical race theory. That we won't pay any attention to. Okay, Chris Hayes does the same thing on MSNBC. He tries to blame the right for even reacting to critical race theory in the first place. He had a Chiron the other day on MSNBC that is so beyond crazy. It's like, he said that the right is fixated on race. We're fixated on race. That's all you guys care about. It's literally all you guys talk about, like 24 hours a day. And when we notice and we push back, then it's, oh, I can't, I can't believe they noticed. I mean, like, really, look at these people obsessed with race. Here's Chris Hayes doing this routine. Critical race theory, uh, as a sort of technical term, is basically a set of analytic tools that academics in some fields use, starting in law, for studying systematic racism in our society. The right has rendered the term meaningless through overdeployment, making it into a culture war rallying cry. Since February, month over month, the mentions of the term have more than doubled. The entire right-wing media machinery has become obsessed, whipping up a moral panic almost entirely among white people that their children are being taught toxic truths about America's long history of racial oppression hierarchy. Okay, it's amazing, right? Oh my God, they're mentioning critical race theory. Yes, we noticed. You mentioned it and we noticed. So the gaslighting is on two levels. One is it's just history. No, it's not. It's an actual theory. That was meant to be an activist theory, according to his founders. Second, the lie is that it doesn't exist. It absolutely does exist, and it has a cost. And the cost is that we are not allowed anymore, according to critical race theory, to call out problems as we see them in the United States, whether they are problems of actual racism or whether they are problems that are not due to racism but result in an unequal outcome. Because it turns out that if you want to prevent unequal outcome, if you would like more equal outcome, people have to act differently. But if you notice that people have to act differently, if, for example, you say that crime should be policed, Right, that you should actually spend time policing crime rather than suggesting that the cops are racist. This is because you have not imbibed from the well of critical race theory. You have not recognized your own white supremacy. You've not recognized that the police are, in fact, a tool of white supremacy in the United States. And the costs of this are largely borne by black Americans. Not entirely, but largely borne by black Americans. Okay, the same people who are pushing critical race theory are pushing defund the police because they believe that the police are, in the words of Nicole Hannah-Jones, basically the heirs to the slave catchers. And so is it any wonder that you see Kids being caught in crossfire in the Bronx. And we have video of kids being caught in a crossfire in the middle of New York City. Okay, this wouldn't have happened even 10 years ago in New York City. When you drink deep from critical race theory, what you end up is with is more suffering, more inequality, more cruelty, more violence, and apparently more happy members of the media. And, and the, the pushback has begun. It should begin. And uh, frankly, I'm, I'm ecstatic to see how far the pushback is going at this point. Uh, again, mobilize, get together with your friends, push back because the time is now. All righty, we'll be back here later today with an additional hour of the Ben Shapiro Show. In the meantime, go check out the Michael Knowles Show today. He's discussing more on how the mayor of Chicago is declaring racism a public health crisis. You can hear more details about this story over on Michael's show that is available right now. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is the Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Elliot Feld. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our assistant director is Pavel Wydowski. Editing is by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Fabiola Cristina. Production assistant is Jessica Kranz. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. Shootings spike in Chicago. Big city mayors let BLM looters off the hook. And Juneteenth replaces the 4th of July. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show. Michael Knowles Show. 